through blood and courage. Tyranny was overthrown. But it was only the first step. As unlikely revolutionaries vie for power, the generals refuse to give up their hold on power and the economy teeters. We've come to Egypt to hear from activists, Islamists, politicians and intellectuals to find out, will Egypt falter? Or can the revolution accomplish what it started? This is Impa. Hello and welcome to Empire from Tahrir Square. I am Marwan Bishara. A year ago, the young people of Egypt have achieved the unthinkable. They overturned decades of despotic rule within days. But ousting a dictator was only the beginning. Replacing dictatorship with democracy proved a far more complicated task in light of the Islamists' control of the National Assembly and the generals' hold on power. Hardly the forces of democracy and freedom. In barely a year, the sense of enthusiasm and collective inspiration across Egypt's revolutionary movement has given way to unease and uncertainty. But there is no denying the magnitude of what has been accomplished. We achieved three items very important. We break the culture of fear, we obtain our right to make demonstration, and third, we obtain our right to criticize the president. Because, you know, in our culture, the president is half president, half God. That president and his dynasty are, of course, now gone. But that doesn't mean freedom and democracy are guaranteed. Despite the success of the first wave of democratic elections, there is a sense that not everyone in society shares the same definition of democracy, least of all, the generals. What is your position today on the role of the Supreme Military Council? The SCAF, you know, they make very fatal mistakes. They are very slow, they are very slow. Everything is very slow. Haven't any experience of the political issue. They know what happened in the military only. Even with profound political changes, the military still holds many of the reins of power and has shown strong and clear signs of not wanting to give them up. One of the leaders of the revolution and staunch advocate of the move to civilian rule is Sheikh Mazar Shaheen. The Imam of Tahrir Square believes the revolution is nowhere near finished. The protesters want the military back in the barracks and believe the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces may be trying to strike a secret deal to share power with the Muslim Brothers. They dream about the Muslim Brotherhood will support them and so we can help them and يعني, you can help each other. We can be stable in Egypt and the Muslim Brotherhood will support them. And that way of thinking means attention now turns to the new political power players. The overwhelming electoral victory of the Muslim Brothers gives them a near majority of the seats in Parliament and the clout to call the shots on economic, judicial, and constitutional reform. The Brotherhood have been building a power base for years, recruiting young and old alike by providing food, education, and social safety net for Egypt's poor. But the question is, will the Muslim Brothers strike some sort of a deal with the armed forces? No. All Islamic parties are against the military now. All of them? Yeah. Because they took power? Yes. They speak about power now. They have power now. But before that, no. You won't make something between him and the military council. The relation was good. After election, no. But not everyone believes it's that straightforward. Many who took part in the revolution believe the political motives of the Muslim Brotherhood are deeply suspicious. The military and the Islamists mm. want to contain the revolutionary movement? Of course. 
contain and overcoming the new generations, controlling the, the, the new uh, generations of the middle middle class, reproducing the same in political rule in Egyptian political system. What role then do the revolutionaries play? You know, we have to interfere in this moment as a secular people to support the secular action. If you leave the, the situation like that eh, and you don't interfere, it will be a disaster. The motives of the military and the two objectives of the Islamists are major questions which have still to be resolved. What kind of deals are being struck to preserve the status quo? And why is it that those who last year were firing the shots are still the ones this year who are calling the shots? For a first-hand perspective on the Muslim Brotherhood's vision for Egypt, I sat down with the group's strongman, Khairat al -Shatr. It's been a year since the removal of Mubarak. What's your assessment of this year? My assessment of the past year is, firstly, the Egyptian people have succeeded in getting what they wanted and forcing Mubarak and his regime to leave. Secondly, the regime has gone, but its culture and regulations still need to be changed. And thirdly, the spirits of the Egyptians were unified to topple Mubarak on the 25th of January. Now they have weakened. Why did that happen? The revolution happened because the toppling of the Mubarak regime was a common goal for all Egyptians. When we start talking about changing politics, whether it should be a presidency or a parliamentary system, common or congressional, inevitably there will be differences and disagreements between parties. Let's talk about that. Uh, I was walking around Tahrir Square the last few days, and I noticed that some people, maybe perhaps a minority for now, almost think of you like the national uh, party. People referring to us as the National Party, it's not true, because the National Party was mainly established based on benefits, whereas the Brotherhood can be defined as having, to some degree, a vision to build our country based on Islamic principles. Like anyone with a vision to build their country, they endorsed the ideas of capitalism, liberalism or socialism. We have the right, too, to have our vision on Islamic principles. An important thing about this vision is that we're not trying to impose it on everyone. It's there. People can either take it or leave it. You spoke about the nature of the Brotherhood. And you said that it is an Islamist movement that's, that has Islamic solutions for the society. Uh, do you think that you are still a revolutionary movement or have you become a revolutionary movement or a reformed uh, movement? Our principle is based on an indefinite, peaceful change, starting with building the individual, then the family, then the people, and then a government to democratically represent these people. This is our main principle. Now, what happened on the 25th of January was the result of oppression and corruption by Mubarak's regime. So. As a result, we rebelled against this regime. In regard to our principles for change, we will go back to our original principles, which is persuading people with our vision. But, uh, you have been against the recent movements on the street, especially civil disobedience. We are neither for nor against these strikes. We're saying two things. First, we are with the people in demonstrating peacefully and we support their right in expressing themselves, even if we disagree with them and reject any forceful confrontation with them. Second, every time the people have demands and take to the street, we cannot go with them. We're a big movement and have to have a clear strategy and evaluate situations based on our strategy. So if we're required to go down and protest, we will. But, but they lost patience, uh, a number of demands, basic demands, were not fulfilled. I want to be clear about something. The military establishment had been ruling Egypt directly or indirectly for more than 60 years. So dealing with this establishment and curing it will take some time. But how are you going to do that? Through pressure, through cooperation, through complicity? 
There is no wisdom that agrees with violent confrontation that results in bloodshed. As for the political confrontation, we must use dialogue. Would you go down to the street again? Most likely. That option is always on the table. One of the most important challenges facing Egypt today is the constitution. Are you about to do a constitution of the majority or a, a consensual constitution? Our main aim is to get a majority agreement, but not the majority alone. However, we understand it's impossible to get everyone to agree. For example, economically, the majority of the right wing comes and demands a free economy. Then the left wing comes, even if they're only 1% of the people, and demand a socialist economy. So how are we going to agree? It's impossible. You have to decide on one. But there are slogans of the revolutions that were very clear demands. I don't reject social justice. Imagine the opposite. I want to assure everyone that we don't have any issue with most of what's on the table. If there is a problem, it would be fitting the military within the constitution. It's a central challenge. Yes. Some might think the problem might be in citizenship, freedom of belief, etc. This is the stereotype people have about us, and they use it to draw their own conclusions. There may be disagreement within the Constitution, but on the question of human rights and citizenship, I personally, and on behalf of the Brotherhood, Freedom and Justice, we have no problem with these issues. Uh, for our international viewers, uh, the question is, it's not just exactly a question of numbers, how much of a majority or how much of a consensus. The question is, will this be an Islamic majority or there will be a consensus with secular and civic forces? Obviously. Our election coalition didn't include Islamic parties like Al-Nur. But on the other hand, we had secular parties, so it's clear. Do you expect to go into coalition government with the Salafists in the future? No. We are two distinct Islamist parties. The idea of an Islamist coalition is unacceptable for us and doesn't exist. We are saying a broad coalition government representing all parties that win seats in the parliament, open to all parties with no exceptions, with the possibility of representing people that weren't previously represented in government. Would you support a, a military president or you only will insist on a civic president? No. Let me make something clear. I don't want to reject a military or a civic president on principle. Now and after 60 years of military ruling, it will be difficult for the Egyptian people to accept a military president. Do you, do you, my last question, do you expect to be partners uh, with the military in the, this next transitional period, or you expect more tensions and perhaps more political confrontation with the generals? We're trying to deal with the issues in a peaceful manner and with as broad agreement as we can. This doesn't mean sharing posts with military generals, but we have a vision as Egyptians that we want to reach a real democratic ruling with different institutions representing the people and to ensure that the right thing is done a peaceful transfer of power, an opportunity available to everyone to benefit from what their country can offer. But the problem here, uh, Bashmandis, uh, is that the, the Islamists and the generals are not exactly known to be democrats. We want to ensure it's a democratic system. The issue isn't just the president or parliament. We mustn't forget that there are former military generals in ministries, committees, mayors, deputies. Therefore, to fix these problems to an acceptable level for the people will certainly take time. I'm applying pressure as long as it doesn't lead to violence and bloodshed. That's a huge challenge. Yes, reform, but bear in mind that both wisdom and maturity is needed in dealing with this issue. When we felt these principles were threatened, we took to the streets in millions, not caring about the military or anyone else. Now they want the government to remain until June 2012, and we're saying that we do too, in the country's interests. Today it's in the freedom and justice interest to delay in order to find serious partners. We must delay, but it's in the country's best interests. On this sobering note, Mash Mahandis. That was the Muslim Brotherhood's view. 
but there are many other voices in Egypt clamoring to be heard. For that, I sat down with three activists to gauge the political mood in the country. Mahmoud, it's the revolution of the youth. Mm -hmm. But the youth are still on the street. They're back to the square. Mm -hmm. So what's your assessment? Has this been a big disappointment? Personally speaking, uh, it's been about 370 days. And until now, there hasn't been a single uh, conviction or account of accountability that has happened towards people who have killed you know, the revolutionaries in the street. Uh, there hasn't been any kind of real uh, accountability or attempts to reform the Ministry of Interior, any serious one at least, you know, in over a year. There hasn't been, uh, until now, there are many people who were involved in the former regime that somehow are still in government or somehow are still running around and doing whatever. And <clears throat> you have a transitional period uh, that was supposed to end in September and somehow got extended in 2013 and it took uh, lots of people going to the streets and getting killed in Khan Mahmoud for people to finally be like, okay, maybe June 2012. So, you so, think, so is your generation running out of patience? Yeah, my generation uh, is a generation that was running out of patience before. So for them, uh, any kind of speedy movement in terms of what needs to be done is essential because they're the ones who are going to carry the weight of this country for the other 30 years. Ahmed, do you think uh, there is such a thing as a youth movement that started the revolution and now has been thrown out of power? This generation has, uh, has made the revolution and starting asking for the change. So we're, we all want the change, not only our generation, but this generation and uh, other generations. So let's talk about the change and are there any uh, possibilities that uh, there is a change or not? And what do we really want to change? Mm -hmm. For uh, the last 130 years since uh, Britain has invaded uh, Egypt, uh, we have uh, a freely elected uh, parliament. This is the, the, the first time. So this is a real accomplishment. Uh, Dina, what I hear now from uh, Mahmoud and Ahmed is a, re a revolutionary impatience and a reformist patience. What's your take on this? It's not uh, to be impatient or to be patient, but just to see a global point of view, what people really need. The young, they have power, and that's the right. And I'm one of the young, actually. Uh, I'm one of the uh, protesters who were in Tahrir Square. I know what we need, I know what we feel. Uh, when we were participating in the revolution, we wanted things to do to be, to be happen fast, just because we wanted to, to get rid of Mubarak. And then we started after uh, the revolution, when he stepped down, we started thinking about how to rebuild and how to, um, to destroy the whole regime. So that's the, the main challenge right now. Mahmoud, differentiate for me, uh, how much of it has been a revolution? How much of it has been a coup d'etat on that level of no, the military? And that's exactly my point. The military's job is to protect our borders. You know, they're the security guard at the end of our very nice villa that is supposed to protect. It's not supposed to tell me how to live. It's not supposed to tell me how I should uh, conduct my affairs. It's not supposed to uh, punish the son of my, uh, the, the friend of my son who caused lots of ruckus and threw him inside the room and beat him. It's not supposed to shoot my son if he ruins something in the villa. And I should have the absolute right and ability to fire this person if push comes to that. When you wanted to have this revolution, you wanted freedom of expression. You wanted freedom of religion to be able to go and pray in your mosques without anybody okay. telling you whatever. And you wanted freedom from fear. The fact that there shouldn't be fear, that yes. there shouldn't be secret apprehensions, that there shouldn't be torture, that there shouldn't be killing of protesters without any kind of accountability or trial. And this has not happened. Let's get to the, the slogans of the revolution. Yes. So the slogans of the revolution were quite simple. Bread, Bread freedom, freedom, and social, social justice. justice. And we have now the leading parties. We have justice, freedom, and nur, light onto the nation. No bread party. There should have been a bread party. Oh, Allah, that's what I've won lots of elections. <laughs> so, is it for you, is this satisfactory? You think now we have an elected parliament and, and, we have, uh, and we have the justice and freedom and we have Noor party? Personally speaking, I find no problem whatsoever with the, with the current makeup of the parliament. People chose what they chose and that's fine. The fact that you have democratically elected institutions does not necessarily mean that you have democracy. The issue is, the institution is the start, but the practice is what counts. You know, so naturally, if there's going to be a parliament, there could be protests against the parliament, and the parliament is not supposed to get mad over the fact that there are protests against it. They could call for more patience. They could say that what's happening is being unfair. Completely their right as well, and those people have the complete right to go protest against it. I guess the Noor party and the justice 
uh, and Freedom Party have accepted the democratic rules of the game or not, Lina? Of course, we, have, we, we before the election started, we said that we will accept the results, whatever is going to happen, because we want to uh, establish for a state of law, state of freedom, state of respecting people's demands. So we stated from the very beginning. Um, and now um, um, I want to say that we, we, we really appreciate protesters' demands and action right now. Uh, speci specific, specifically, I'm talking about the peaceful uh, way how to, to, to express your demands. Don't you notice that every time some of these concessions made by the military have, done, have been done under pressure from the street? And we have many ways to do that pressure. One of the ways is to protest in streets, and we have another diplomatic ways. So maybe it's not so vivid for people, but it's it's been done. So it's how to do Which it. Which is what? To, to call for, to have a delegation to go and to talk and to try to use pressure because we have now the power of people, uh, uh, voters. So I have now this power. Before, I, I didn't have it. So let's do it. Let's take people power so that we can talk about by, by using this power. So that's another way to have pressure. For you as a, as, a, as a, let me call you a younger member of the Salafi yeah. movement. <laughs> so how does it feel for you now to keep talking about democracy, democracy, for our first day of democracy? This is not exactly part of your discourse in the past. So how, do you feel that there is a transition now in the movement? No, let, let me tell you something. If I'm talking about democracy, it's just like freedom. It, you don't have the freedom to be, for example, go naked in the streets. You don't have the right. That there is a law even in America called indecent exposure that will judge you if you did this. All right? So what do you mean exactly by freedom? Democracy is to make le legislation all right, that misfits with the Quran. All right? Mahmoud tells you democracy is the rule of the democratic values. No, there are two definitions for democracy. Please let me complete. All right? This is a very important issue. All right? if, you, if you said this is only the democracy, we, we, we disagree with, with this meaning. But if you, you're talking about the mechanism of democracy that is is being practiced now, all right, which is the election, which is the how to choose the, 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 the president, which is the consultancy, which is a very, very important uh, uh, role in Islam. And it has been mandated on Muslims to take a consultancy. It's called the shura, all right? The president Ahmed, has no right to take... Ahmed, exp explain to our international uh, uh, viewers. Uh, Ahmed, hold on. Just explain to our international viewers. What do you mean exactly? Is, is the last word to the people or is the last word to the sheikhs who interpret Sharia? No, th this is a different understanding. I understand your question, but the problem is... But you're not going to answer it? I will answer it. Mm. Uh, make legislation whatever you want, mm. but in one condition that does not conflict with the uh, Quran. Who decides that? Who decides? If it this is our that? ideology. We're going to have to round it up. Mahmoud, Dina, Ahmad, thank you for joining us. We need to take a short news break, but when we come back, we'll look beyond politics into the long-term implications of the revolution on Egypt's identity and culture. Welcome back. Beyond Egypt's immediate political and security concerns and its economic preoccupations, New questions are being posed over the very nature of the state and its identity, with the conservative and ultra-conservative bloc now occupying two-thirds majority in the People's Assembly. What will become of Egypt's open and diverse culture? For the Arab world, Egypt has been a beacon of culture for centuries. But could this secular cosmopolitan identity be about to change with the sudden entrance onto the political scene of ultra-conservative Islamist parties? To separate uh, Islamic religion from the state is something that is refused. Islam and Islamic Sharia will be above all, and will be above all uh, rules. One of the unforeseen consequences of Egypt's revolution was the emergence of the Salafis into mainstream politics, something they had always shunned. They didn't accept the validity of the political process in Egypt because they felt that it, were, it was governed or framed within democratic and secular norms and that their project was about the establishment of Sharia law. With the revolution, all that changed. The Salafis formed the Noor party and went on to win a quarter of parliamentary seats. For me, it was a surprise that external observers were so much surprised 
about our, uh, we can say our victory. We had a lot of work, a social responsibility with our people in the past 30 years. So we depended on this strong uh, ground when we formulated our party. The Salafis have been on the ground for decades now. They completely boycotted the political process, but that doesn't mean that they boycotted people. The Muslim Brotherhood and Salafis were still uh, opening hospitals, providing people with ovens and cows and schooling and clothes, and they kind of reaped what they sowed. The Salafis' principles are based on an ultra-conservative interpretation of Islamic traditions and practices dating back to the 7th century. The movement originated in the Gulf states, an important source of funding for the Nur party. Outside the mosque, Salafis use cassettes, radio stations and satellite television to spread their message. Attracting young and old, Islamist parties who promise a more ethical approach to politics than their often corrupt predecessors are a growing trend across the wider Middle East. Their popular success is proof that Egyptians too want religion and morality to play a greater role in society. I think there's no denying that what we've seen taking place in Morocco and Tunisia and in Egypt lends to kind of understanding that there is a resurgence of Islam. It is a religious society and that's not something that just happened last year. Having won more than a quarter of the popular vote, they will now play an important role in writing the constitution, defining society and politics in the new Egypt. But how committed are they to the democratic process? In one of the first sessions of Egypt's new parliament, the Salafis broke into prayer and were shouted down by the Muslim Brotherhood. Salafi politicians try to sound reassuring. A democracy here is either in conjoint with the uh, uh, with Islamic uh, principles. We will give everyone the uh, the freedom to express uh, his feeling, to express his uh, point of view. Whether or not they honour these promises will have a huge impact on Egypt's identity. I don't think that the Salafis will determine the long-term future of the country. There is a generation of people, far younger uh, than those representing them in parliament, who have had a taste of freedom, who have emancipated themselves, and that generation is not going anywhere. Having heard the politicians and the activists, we broaden our discussion with three of Egypt's leading intellectuals, Ahdaf Suwaif, Khalid Fahmi, and Azidin Shukri, regarding the promise and perils of the Egyptian Revolution. Welcome to Empire, I guess, welcome to the program. Uh, let's start uh, by looking retroactively to the last year. The youth and the people basically are still in the streets. The most unlikely results of the revolution, a revolution for democracy and freedom, are the military establishments and the Islamists, basically the Salafists that we watched before are probably the most vocal today. What does that mean? What does that tell you about the revolution, Khalid? I think the most vocal still is the, what I would call the Tahrir crowd. Uh, they're not the most powerful, but they're the most vocal in terms of the originality of their ideas, of the excitement that they have uh, uh, instilled in, 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 uh, in society at large, of the new ideas that are circulating mostly because of them. Um, the, the scene has really radically uh, changed. Whatever SCAF and the Islamists are saying is very old stuff, nothing new. Um, and I think in, in, a, in a very important sense they are panicking because of this. The slogans and the jokes and the songs and the art that has been produced by this revolution is really unprecedented. And in that sense things have really changed. The question, however, politically these youth groups are not really those in power. Hadef, it seems to me as an outsider the Islamists and the generals are li still leading the way. Marwan, I think that what this tells us about the revolution is really how very brave and how very determined it is. You know, the military were always the heart of the regime and for them to actually leave power as we want them to do is, is like an enormous, you know, an almost unthinkable step, except that it is thinkable and they are going to have to do it. Um, 
And we've known for a long time now that if you have elections, you're going to get the Islamists. So Perhaps the Brotherhood wasn't a surprise, but certainly the Salafis getting a quarter of the vote. But the thing is, you know, the Salafists had always said that they were not political, that they were not going to enter into politics. And maybe that is why they actually have such a large cons constituency, because people were drawn to them, you know, because you, you live the private moral life and so on. But the fact is that they are very, very numerous on the ground. So if every Salafi, and they are very well organized, and they, you know, listen and obey, if every one of them went out and voted, then you get the result we've got. As a dean, you think we're still on track, even though, for example, uh, the Hezb al-Nur, which is the, the political arm of the Salafi movement, is leading something like the education committee in parliament? I, I frankly don't think that there is a track. I think what this says about the revolution is that it is simply Egyptian, and I'm you know, only half joking. Um, if you look at the traffic in Cairo, this is how it works. The revolution is unfolding exactly in the same way. So you chaotic? have chaotic and rather messy, but so far without major disasters happening. Obviously, um, the fact that the military are still at the helm and that they're surrounded by um, a 70% parliament, 70% uh, Islamist parliament, says a lot about the fact that those who contributed most to the revolution are not in power. So the next phase doesn't worry you in terms of those unlikely Democrats being at the helm. The worrying side is obvious. You have um, Salafis leading the education committee, as you said. You have all, all, all those signs you can see in the parliament are worrying because, frankly, this, those are not the signs that were in Tahrir Square. But all of this, in my view, is still, we're still at phase one, where we're fighting the authoritarian regime that is still entrenched in state institutions. Once this struggle is over, once the authoritarians are finally out, once someone else is at the helm, then the real struggle will start. Then the real revolution, if you want, will begin to unfold. Hadaf, there seems to me that as, as the, deans, the authoritarianism he's talking about is not only in the institutions, but it is now in the society. It is now in the political parties. Does that worry you? What the revolution has done is it has been very anti-authoritarian. And the people have now rejected authoritarianism. Now, what's very interesting, of course, is that this is something, authoritarianism is a, a value and a way of behaving that is shared by the military and the Islamist um, you know, organizations. And so, in fact, I think that that puts them both against the, um, the spirit of, of the revolution and the spirit that's taking hold in the country. As a novelist, do you think there is uh, authoritarianism in the makeup of a religiously oriented political party or not? What I know is that there is authoritarianism in the Brotherhood and in the Salafis and that that is the central reason why many of their young people have been leaving them. I guess Khaled, this gets to your point. So is there still hope from this horizontal relationship among the youth and could they still reverse the tables against uh, the other forces, the unlikely Democrats, if you will? They already have. Mm. I mean, there is something so deep, uh, goes beyond politics and elections and parliament, this deeply irreverent, cynic, not cynical, actually, it's not cynical. It's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. Yeah, in a good way. <laughs> in a good way and in a peaceful way. They've been, uh, they've lost uh, life and limb, they've lost loved ones, um, and, and, and uh, they're fighting against really uh, huge odds. And despite all of this, they've maintained their peaceful, humorous, uh, very, very self-confident. You, you, you have to be in Tahrir, the most amazing thing, it's nearly palpable to see and to feel this enormous f sense of, of self-confidence. So in that sense, things have changed. This is a youthful country. And this uh, youthful genera generations have been disenfranchised for such a long time. And uh, for these people to, in my mind, they're the ones who set the agenda. As a dean, then, it seems to me there are two cultural forces, if you will, are on the rise. There is that uh, youth with its own ideas, with its own genre, if you will. 
And there is the new Salafists and the other Islamists around the block. How do you think this will evolve? I think the two forces we have are not the Islamists and the youth. They're simply the youth and the very old people. It's the older culture. You're and a generational question. Yeah, it's not an age issue. It's a, it's a mindset. The older mindset, the older culture in Egypt is patriarchal. And it's cross-political. You, 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 you can find it in any political organization. If you go to the Islamist, you will find that um, Islamist organizations are run by people who are part of this culture. If you go to the communists and other leftists, you will find that they're also run, their organizations are run by the same kind of mindset, and so on and so forth. And it goes all the way to the military and security. Underneath, under the garb of this old officialdom, in all organizations and institutions, you have a thriving Egypt of a younger generation and a younger mindset and a fresher look at the world. You will find this new emerging culture, you will find it among Islamists as well. You will find it among Salafis. That might surprise you. You will find the same in the uh, Muslim Brothers, and then you will find it in the least likely place, Ministry of Interior. Talk to the young, the young officers, not the ones doing the shooting themselves, but you know there are a, a lot more, and talk to them about security reform, how they, you know, how they see reform, how can it be done? And their immediate answer is, you have to remove the older layers, because in my view, it's only a matter of time before we push this old, almost dead layer out, and then deal with all our issues as any society does. Adef, it seems to me, as the Dean's optimism needs to be questioned, so at, at least for that. <laughs> do you share that optimism, or do you think now we have something to worry about with a parliament, with, our, with institutions that are old and are in control? What I'm worried about now is the next phase which we will have to live through until the military let go. What we're having now is we're having a group of old men killing a lot of young people. And the fear is that this is going to, to continue until we actually prize them out of power. What's happening, of course, is that the military are looking to make a deal, and they're looking to make a deal with the power that is in place at the moment. With the Islamists? Yes. The vision of labor? Um, well, one takes on security and, uh, no, they, and they sovereignty, want certain... if you will, and one takes internal affairs, education, social welfare and so on. It's a bit more than that. They want guarantees of their central place, um, you know, in, in the finances of this country. So, so what economy. does that tell you then? If, if the most patriarchal, the most authoritarian, most powerful groups in the country divide the influence in the country among them, I mean, that's, that's pretty tough for whatever youthful generations are. Well, it's natural that that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's natural that we, not that we, speaking for myself, are youth, but certainly on the side of the youth, are going to do every single thing in our power to stop, to stop that happening. Which brings me back to the question I asked Khaled. Do you think the youth are able to reverse the tables? Yes, definitely. You see, if we thought that they couldn't, then there would just really be no point hmm. to continuing with this, uh, this enterprise of the revolution to, to anything, if what we actually believed was that authoritarianism is going to triumph. It isn't. 60% mm -hmm. um, of this country is young and the old are old mm -hmm. and they are few and they are ill and they are tired and they are boring and they... And they lack imagination. Lack imagination mm -hmm. and, and ultimately they lack energy. You keep on referring to them as the two central po powers and, and of course, yes, the military is power by definition. But I really think they've been defeated. And I think the Egyptian army is really ultimately very, very weak as a political institution. And it has lost so much, not only credibility, it has lost, well, the army didn't have much to start with. It's not uh, an army that has a, a, a huge role in founding the modern state of Egypt. And it's an army that paradoxically, because of this huge amount of money that receives from the United States each year for not fighting effectively uh, has made it very vulnerable in a very paradoxical way. It has allowed it not to reach any consensus or compromise with anyone else. So the army has no political partner. 
Um, and if I were the Ikhwan, which is what you're... The brotherhood. The brotherhood now, with this huge victory in parliament, what really would prompt them to, have a, to reach a, a compromise um, with, with SCAF? So whether they cannot fight in the battlefield or not, but certainly they've been calling the shots in this country. Yes, they have. And they've been doing it uh, with the Muslim Brothers, not, um, not alone. Uh, but if you also look at the agenda of last year, you will find out, you will see that they have been pushed back repeatedly by the unorganized messy crowd um, in Tahrir Square. So then Khaled is right. I, I agree with Khaled, not because the army is weak militarily or didn't fight or fought, but I think this useful Egypt is pushing, and it will keep pushing. It will turn the tables eventually, or even throw the tables outside the window, because ultimately this is the majority of the society, and it's an active. It's an act. It's it. This majority is led by an active group that is fed up, and the things they ask for are not that revolutionary when you think about them. They ask just they want to be like every other nation. They want Egypt to be like any other country. They just want to be normal people. And this is very difficult to resist. Khaled, how will this translate in terms of that which Egypt has been most famous, most blessed with? Culture, diversity, plurality, creativity, the arts. Looking at the art scene, in downtown Cairo, looking at the new books, new movies, new songs. There was something really amazing and, and continues to be, and it has been mushrooming and flourishing like never before. Mm. Uh, I don't think that the Islamists would manage to, uh, to put a, a stop on this. Do you expect them they will try? Um, yes, because, Isla because Salafis in particular are very sensitive about cultural issues, about questions about identity. It's not that uh, Salafis or Islamists at large have a point about foreign affairs or the economy or transportation or the uh, energy problems that Egypt have. But once you touch on these issues about women or culture or art, or, then they are very vocal. There is no underestimation of what the Islamists were capable of doing. They won more than two thirds, almost three quarters of the vote in the country which basically says that the secular, the more liberal voices in this country are not in touch with the people in Egypt. Yes, there is a majority in this country that sees a fusion between religion and politics as something important. Yes, there is a majority in this country that feels its identity is deeply intertwined with Islam. Those are facts. And yes, the liberals and seculars are a minority in this sense, if the focus is on this. But what, I've, what we have been saying, if I understand correctly, is that the new culture traverses these divisions. And what does that mean for the future identity of Egypt? The battle over the identity of Egypt has been lost decades ago, and that we haven't seen it, we haven't noticed it enough because of the layer of the authoritarian state Today, and for the last 20 years, if you flick the remote control and watch the Egyptian TV, the official TV under Mubarak, it is not very different from an Islamic state. It's not different from the Sudanese TV under the Islamist or from the Iranian TV. So, lacks creativity, lacks imagination. Lacks yes, but also a lot of prayers and a lot of um, religious discourse. You read the school um, uh, curriculum and it's the same and so on. So. They have won over society long time ago. The only difference today is we're removing this artificial layer and we are communicating with each other and we're allowed to ask them and putting them in the responsibility position say, okay, how are you going to answer these questions now? And their own audience are going to do the same. Uh, so Adaf, where is this going in Egypt? Do you think this is going to now, since it's freed from dictatorship, it's going to evolve or it's going to have a new challenge called the Islamists and their own phobias, if you will, from movies, theater, and so on. I think that we needn't concern ourselves too much with what happens to art because, because art will happen anyway. And it will happen, you know, possibly the more you push against it, the more it, it will happen. I think that what we're concerned with now is actually social justice. Uh, you know, and, and 
and freedom. And I think that those are the essential things that we should be moving on the road towards and everything else will kind of, will come along. But I also wanted to say, since last January, um, it's been very clear that the young people are questioning everything in a very positive way. And I think that if we sort of manage to get to a situation where we are not living through crisis after crisis, which actually kills people and then puts more people out on the street to get killed and so on. We are going to be in an experiment which rethinks a whole lot, if not every societal kind of given. And people know this and people talk about how exciting it is mm. and how challenging and how wonderful to be at a, a point historically and geographically where you are trying to forge a completely new model of doing things, an Egyptian model. Your optimism is overwhelming and I'm going to have to stop with that. Ahdaf, Azadine, Khalid, thank you for joining Empire. Thank you. Thank you. Egypt's beloved game, football, is under assault because of politics, not sports. Premier League matches postponed indefinitely, the Football Association sacked and its members facing prosecution. There is mounting evidence of a conspiracy behind the killings of more than 70 football supporters who also happen to be supporters of the revolution and its defenders in the public squares of the country. Egypt's leading footballer, Mohamed Abutreka, has accused the security and military services of complicity in the killings. And to add insult to injury, a Salafi leader blamed what he called the sinful and Islamic sport for the death of the innocents and called for its ban. Football will of course survive all its critics. After all, the people's game is now part of the people's revolution. And that's the way it goes. Write to me with your suggestions. Until next time. <laughs>